Thank you, Barclay. A view as far as you can see. Unimaginable colors and shapes. Extreme dry and barren. Literally breathtaking. 66 huge radio dishes, and however large they are, they seem to disappear in the distance. About this, About this, about Alma, I will, um, I will tell you this afternoon my impressions, more than facts. Um, I have 40 minutes. This is a huge project, and I've chosen to uh, concentrate on uh, explaining my fascination and my impressions. And the facts, you can, I will point you to the facts later. Um, I had three jobs in three years in Alma. And these three, three, these three jobs, will, uh, I will use them to guide you through on a virtual tour through the project, because they are very well suited to, uh, to explain what Alma uh, has gone through in those three years. And uh, to make a little correction to what Barclay said, the observatory is there. It's finished. It's working. So it's, and it's a great success. My name is Riek Jager. I am, uh, my background is project manager of large astronomical uh, uh, instrumentation. And this is an overview at the top left starting. That's a BAPO SAC satellite, wide field cameras in the X-ray region. Uh, at the left, the proud project manager presenting his three models. And at the right, an even more proud project manager with his six years old daughter on his shoulder uh, watching the rocket just a few hours before it was launched. Uh, great experience. Uh, then uh, I was involved in James Webb Space Telescope, the MIRI instrument, the mid-infrared instrument, so from X-rays to infrared. Uh, I was involved in the ALMA in one of the ALMA receivers, the Band 9 receivers, uh, that were uh, built in, uh, in Groningen, in the Netherlands. Uh, then ALMA, of course, that's the topic of my talk today. And now, at this moment, I'm working as a consortium project manager for one of the first instruments on the European Extremely Large Telescope, which will be uh, hopefully ready in 10 years' time. So as a system integration manager, my first job, I uh, spent uh, about one third of my time in Santiago de Chile, the capital of Chile. And here we find the headquarters of ALMA, the joint ALMA observatory, uh, neighboring the ESO headquarters. Um, first plans of uh, ALMA, they, uh, they came up uh, at the end of the last century when the three, part, the three big partners, North America, East Asia, and, uh, and Europe, uh, got together and tried to join their three separate plans for submillimeter observatory uh, into one big plan. So uh, that uh, there would be synergy there. Um, uh, the scientists, uh, scientists were, were a big uh, motor behind that, of course. Uh, that all worked out as planned. Uh, total budget was about $1.5 billion, which is a lot of money, but if you, as you can see later, it's actually nothing, if you see what you get. A um, bit more than nothing. Uh, operational cost, $40 million. And by nature, um, uh, because of the international uh, uh, collaboration, uh, ALMA is a, is a very international um, uh, community. Here you see me uh, in the center uh, because I was chairing, um, uh, of, uh, chairing the team, uh, a team meeting uh, uh, of my uh, system integration team. And uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of test scientists and uh, coordinators. And uh, there were, uh, among the seven uh, or eight test scientists, there were eight nationalities. And uh, if you ask me how how is that? I think I can say I really enjoyed it. It's very inspiring. Um, uh, 
they were very motivated, and the differences uh, are much smaller than the commonalities. Well, it's a great pleasure. Every week, my colleagues and I flew two hours to the north, to Kalama. Uh, it's the same distance as Amsterdam, Rome, uh, uh, on eight six shifts, eight days on, six days off. And I can say that it's the best commuting uh, that in my life. It's uh, six hours door to door, and there, were, there was not one boring moment. So you travel ac across, uh, along the Andes, very colorful, beautiful mountain range. You pass the Aconcagua Mountain, the largest one of the Americas, almost 7,000 meters. You pass the Escondida copper mine. It's the biggest one in, in Chile and one of the biggest in the world. Not as deep as the one that Ronnie spoke about, four and a half kilometers. This one is only one kilometer deep, open pit. It's a beautiful sight from above. After about almost six hours, you reach the Alma Gate, where uh, everyone has to pass that uh, wants to visit Alma. You have to be pre-registered. There's a strict security system, of course. And then the last 700 meters up, we arrive at the operations support facility. It's uh, the log logistic center of Alma. Uh, it's a self-supporting desert island uh, where uh, in the heydays, uh, like uh, 200, 300 people were living 24-7 uh, uh, together, living, working, sleeping, eating, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, one back. On the right side here, there are the three vendor camps. The three partners each uh, produce their own antennas. Uh, this is the American camp. This is the uh, East Asian, the Japanese camp. And this is the uh, European camp. They all have their own antennas. I'll come back to that later. This is the technical facility where all the uh, offices and, uh, and workshops are, are uh, located. Uh, at the rear, there is the location where the antennas are integrated and tested. And over here, um, uh, we have the, the uh, recreational facility, the dormitories, the hotel facility, etc. And here you can see the road going up, 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 up to this is 3,000 meters. The level here is about 4,000 meters. And the Alma array uh, operational site, where all the antennas are located, is behind that range at 5,000 meters. This is a view of the, uh, of the OSF, as you, uh, as, you, as you see if you, tr if you get off the bus. There's the dormitories and the antenna stations in the, in the distance. Control room, the OSF is also the place where um, uh, the, telescope, uh, the telescopes are, uh, are uh, controlled from. And every once in a while, uh, all the flags are raised. Uh, it's about 20, the 20, 20, 20 plus flags of all the countries involved. It's a real global collaboration. And uh, they are only up when, uh, when there's a special occasion, because if you leave them up uh, in, a, in a month or so, they are disappeared because of the fierce UV, UV radiation and, and the winds. So it's a special site if you see this. So AIV, Assembly Integration Verification, was my main activity, was the main activity uh, 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 in the years that I was uh, involved. Uh, that means that uh, tons of special high-tech equipment uh, from all over the globe uh, arrives at the OSF. And uh, we are putting them together like a, a, a rather complicated IKEA assembly kit. Sometimes with the same problems, with comparable problems that you, that you might have, uh, that, that we all know, I think. Um, so, as I, as I said before, uh, we can see here the four uh, types of antennas, uh, the North Americans. And it's easy to recognize uh, from the outside because of the support structure of the secondary mirror. But there are more differences inside. Um, and that's not, uh, let's say, that's not the way you would like to uh, design the project. But this is something that you get if you put three big parties together and collaborate in a beautiful uh, 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 collaboration 
but each party had the strong wish to spend, of course, uh, uh, a significant fraction of their money in their own industries. And so the, the antennas are different, but they function the same. The specifications are the same, the interfaces are the same. So all the equipment that, uh, that uh, uh, will be integrated in the antennas is, uh, fits in all the antennas. And if you ask the American ones, they say, well, we think that ours is really a bit better than the other ones. And the others, they say the same. And uh, I can say that they're all good. They're all according to specs. And the differences are nice, but not essential. So don't believe them. Um, yeah, this it's not, uh, you don't have to read this all, uh, but this shows uh, the distribution of, the, of, the, of where all the subsystems come from. There, as I said, there are three big partners in the, in the collaboration, and uh, due to uh, also the division of the, of the, of the work, uh, the, the division of the, of the expertises all over the world, uh, there, there was, a, 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 well, this, this shows where all the stuff came from. Europe, East Asia, and North America. We will not go into details. If you want to know more, then I can tell you separately, or you can find it on the internet. Um, system engineering here, for these, uh, let's say, high-tech, close to the science equipment, has been very successful. Uh, there were multinational uh, uh, integrated product teams for all these equipments, uh, where, the co where co uh, they coordinated the design, manufacturing, and testing. Um, so it was, I would say, system engineering by the book, uh, requirements, uh, traceability, verification, interfaces, change control board, acceptance reviews. It was all in place and, and worked. Um, this, is, um, uh, this shows the first activity after we, that's the JAO, received the antennas from the antenna vendors uh, that I just showed on, uh, showed on the camp. Um, this is the setting, measuring and setting of the, of the, of the dish. Uh, the uh, antenna vendors can deliver, shall deliver uh, the dishes with an accuracy of about 40 microns, which is already quite accurate. Uh, but what we need is uh, 12 microns. And for that purpose, we have a, a hologra holography tower where there's an, a millimeter wave, wave transmitter on top. Uh, there is a hologra holography uh, receiver mounted at the secondary uh, uh, focus. And um, uh, by uh, measuring um, the, the, the pattern of the receiver here, this is, the, this is a map before, uh, as we received the antenna, and this is a map after. That means that the guy here uh, has a tool where he, uh, he or she uh, uh, adjusts every separate sub-panel in this dish with so many microns that it's, it will fit exactly the parabola that's needed. Um, this picture is uh, just a summary of, let's say, the equipment that was uh, installed in each antenna. Uh, we have the receivers. We have the cryostat containing the receivers here. Um, we have the backend electronics. We have fiber optic wraps, and we have much more. And altogether, it takes it takes um, two to three months before everything is integrated and tested. And um, my task when I started this, uh, this first job was to speed up the AIV uh, uh, cycle uh, from a few antennas, uh, uh, a few months per antenna to two antennas per month. And that was necessary because the project had to finish by the end of 2013. And otherwise, it would have taken up to 2017 even. And uh, we, uh, we were successful there. It was a very good team. Um, two to three months, two antennas per month, means uh, that we were working in parallel on six to eight antennas, but sometimes we even had full house. There were 10 spots where we could work, 
So in this case, all 10 antenna locations were filled and our teams were working in parallel on all these antennas. Okay, so after one year, AIV was on schedule. That was very good. And then I jumped to my second job, site construction manager, responsible for the power. It's the power station. Something completely different, but uh, also very important. Um, what, we, what, we, what, we, what I've seen in Alma is that, uh, as I, I just said, that system engineering in, on the, on, let's say, on the high-tech stuff, stuff is, is very, uh, uh, very successful. Uh, but on the low-tech stuff, uh, it's, it, it, beca it, has beca it has gotten less uh, attention. Uh, that means that uh, that there were several problems with this uh, with this uh, with this power station. Um, and when I kind of let's say volunteered after a year, uh, said, "Well, let me try to do something here," then people said, "You must be crazy. This is a headache uh, 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 thing." But I thought, well. It's not going very well, and it can only go better because we, one thing is for sure: this thing will work. So, and we did that. So, I did, I'm very happy that I w was able to uh, to uh, give my contribution. So, why do we have a power station? Well, uh, as I said, Alma is a uh, the OSF, and 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 the other, the high side, is a desert island. That means that we are completely self-supporting. Um, a few years ago, when, uh, when everything was set up, uh, it was investigated whether um, uh, we could connect to the grid, which is the most logical thing to do, of course. Uh, but the nearest grid point was, uh, is, is still uh, more than 150 kilometers away. And Alma uses only, let's say, a few megawatts. So it, was, it turned out that that was not uh, um, um, sufficiently economic. So then it w the, the choice was made to become self-supporting. Um, there were two issues with this power, with, with the power station in general. One is, um, and I will start with the first, but I will concentrate on the second. One is that the design um, and, the, and the scoping of the, of the station was not optimal, um, and that's a system engineering related item. Um, what, what was, let's say, not optimally done because of underestimating uh, the, the amount of effort needed for system engineering, what not was optimally done was um, keeping budgets. So when, this, when the, the order was placed for this machine, for these machines, uh, the, uh, the estimates for the power, the, need, the power needed were, uh, were had a, at a certain level. And uh, so now we have three of these machines, uh, each capable of delivering four megawatts. And uh, at that time it was fitting because we expected to have seven megawatts, to need seven megawatts. At the moment it's only uh, three megawatts. So it's, uh, it's more than a factor of two oversized. And that is a pity, it's expensive. But there's not so much we can do at this moment. In the future, it's, it will be possible. Another issue where, uh, where I worked, where, and me and my team worked very hard on that, the quality of the deliveries was, uh, uh, let's say, not optimal. Um, and, that, uh, and that's partially also, that's also because the, uh, it's, you know, these are commercial off-the-shelf machines in a way. There are thousands of these turbine systems everywhere over the world. But um, um, uh, having one working at 3,000 meters in, a, in, a, in an extremely dry uh, uh, area um, um, is, uh, is a different thing. So we had lots of problems getting this, getting this to work. Let me speed up a bit. So, I told you this will be a tour. So now we leave the OSF with an antenna on the, specific, on the special transporter. Here, it's a special machine. 
Antenna is weighing, has a mass of about 100 tons, very sensitive equipment. The transporter weighs about 140 tons, so altogether it's about 240, 250 tons going up the mountain. 27 kilometer long road, 2,000 meters up, 12 meters wide. And that brings me to another topic, uh, which has also caused us uh, some, uh, some uh, headaches. Um, this, is not a, this is a special road. Um, it's, it's special because it, it, needs, it needs to be very wide, and it's a mountain road, of course. It, it is not, uh, a, there's no tarmac on it. It's, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's a salt and, 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 and soil uh, uh, stabilized road, which is very common in, uh, in the north of Chile and in, uh, in Peru, which is a good way to do it. But these roads, this type of roads are vulnerable for water. That means that you have to take care that if there is rain, and there is rain, you can see there's snow here, um, that uh, the water is taken, is not destroying the road. And as you can see here, um, that was not always successful. And in terms of system engineering, no, it's not so much system engineering, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of, uh, of economy. Um, all partners involved in Alma had a certain budget, of course, and uh, so this is a, a result of uh, a not optimal balance between uh, 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 construction cost and operational cost. So here uh, we see that uh, if, if we would have spent a little bit more on a, a bit safer uh, construction of the road, then we wouldn't have had these, these issues. But they were solved, of course, later on. So now, before we enter the AOS, the Array Observation uh, or, uh, Operational Site, I first want to mention the inauguration that we had in, uh, in March 2013. At the center, you see the then President uh, Piñera and uh, the Director General of ESO and other uh, uh, directors uh, joined with my team, our team. And uh, this, uh, this happened in March 2013. And at that moment, we, have, we were 80% ready, uh, ready for science. Uh, and that this also signaled a very uh, important priority change. Before that, um, uh, AIV, construction, was main priority. And that made life kind of easy. Uh, after that, science was more highest priority, which is, of course, very important, uh, but made uh, construction, the remaining construction operations, uh, uh, construction activities uh, more, uh, more difficult. And this also signaled the start of my third job, head of ADE, uh, Alma Department of Engineering. But first, back to the tour. After a five hour ride, with about five, six kilometers per hour, we arrive at the AOS with a precious load, and the antenna is then transported to uh, an antenna pad of where it has to be put down, and then it will be connected and made operational. So the first question you have, of course, uh, and um, I will answer that question, is why are we here? Why at 5,000 meters in the Atacama Desert? Uh, well, the answer is, um, ALMA is um, uh, meant to study the cold universe. So it's where uh, planets are born, where solar systems have, are, will be, are, are, are uh, being uh, uh, born. Those, uh, uh, those features emit millimeter radiation. So it's very high frequency radio waves. And um, this is an example of, uh, just one example of a spectrum that, uh, that, uh, that, will, that will be measured, that is being measured. Uh, all these lines uh, are, uh, are signatures of, uh, of uh, sometimes very complicated molecules. And uh, they, uh, give the, they show the composition of the gas clouds that are forming new stars and planets. 
and ALMA is tuned to observe in the atmospheric windows that, that, that allow these frequencies to pass because these frequencies are very easily absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere, so you have to go to a very high and dry place. And that is why this place in Chile was selected. So, how do we operate? Next one. Time to describe shortly how ALMA works. ALMA is a distributed telescope. That means that one, all these, tele, all these antennas together, we call them array elements, all these together form one big telescope. It's an interferometer, like there are more interferometers in the world, like the VLA, Westerbork, uh, there are more. Um, and, um, so this array can be changed from a compact array to a very extended array. And if it's extended, it functions as a zoom lens. So you can focus very, uh, with very high accuracy to a small area on the sky. But sometimes you want to have a kind of a wide angle lens, and then you put them all together. And that's very important. And that's the reason why on this plane we have a very extensive uh, infrastructure, uh, power, uh, fibers, uh, uh, yeah, power and fibers mainly. <clears throat> so, yeah, and why 16 kilometers? Um, the radiation that we, that we uh, uh, receive from the sky is uh, about 1,000 times longer in wavelengths than the optical uh, wavelengths. Um, that we are that we are uh, sensitive, whereas, uh, where our eyes are sensitive for, and what the astronomers want is they want in this wavelength range, in this submillimeter wavelength range, the same kind of um, resolution as we have in uh, in the optical. Uh, but if the wavelengths are th thousand times longer, you need a thousand times long, uh, larger telescope, and that's why this 10 to 16 kilometer uh, size has been chosen. That means that the resolution, the highest resolution, is better than uh, with uh, the, the biggest telescopes in the world at the moment, opti optical telescopes. So how is it organized? Well, we have a, a, a big building, a technical building at 5,000 meters. That's kind of the core uh, uh, at the high site where the, where the central equipment is located. It's kind of, uh, it hosts the heart of the, of the observatory. You can envisage uh, ALMA as a, as a, as a kind of an organism where the eyes and the ears are uh, uh, the antennas. Uh, the brains is uh, the correlator, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a supercomputer, very, very uh, specialized for specifically uh, combining the signals from all these uh, telescopes. We have, uh, this, I call it uh, uh, the nerves, that those are the fibers, and the spinal cord is the fiber optics pa patch panel. This is, in a way, it, it's familiar to the old-fashioned telephone uh, 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 systems where a lady, usually a lady, uh, connected uh, you to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the party that you want to uh, talk to. Because the correlator can handle 64 antennas, 64 lines, but we have 190 positions where the antennas can be located. So that's why if you move an antenna from one place to another, you move the connection here. And these fiber optic connections, are, they are very specific as well. So you need trained, trained staff to, to make these connections. Ten minutes. OK, we switch from construction to operations. No, first the central local oscillator. That's the heart. We need a very, very, very precise timing at all the telescopes in order to do the, uh, the, the correlation of, these, uh, of the signals. Um, so it, uh, it looks like uh, just a set of uh, electronic uh, boxes, but it's, uh, it contains a very uh, strong laser, and it's a very sophisticated equipment. And that's all at 5,000 meters. 
So, operations. Um, this is this shows that it, the that the climate on, at at the site can be harsh, and this is nothing. It can be a real blizzard sometimes. So it means that there are very difficult working conditions. They can be very difficult, and it's always difficult because of the low oxygen uh, con uh, contents of the air. Uh, we have. Um, um, at, uh, we have uh, about 55% of the of the oxygen that's at sea level. So, uh, if you if you and uh, if you need to work with great concentration, you need additional oxygen always. Uh, it's inaccessible during snowstorms or at night. So that requires uh, very efficient maintenance. So if people go, if staff goes up to the high site, then you need to be sure that they, that, they are, uh, that they work in an efficient way and in a safe way. So you need multi-expertise teams. You, you send up a car with an electronics guy and with a mechanics guy and with, a, uh, with some other uh, expertise that you need. Um, and that was part of my duty as head of ADE, the Alma Department of Engineering, to uh, change, let's say, to, to rearrange the, the, the organization such that uh, people, uh, 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 let's say, can work more efficient uh, in, uh, in, uh, for maintenance. It's a different style, a different way of working, and a different mindset if you construct something or if you operate something. Well, this is one way to uh, to uh, optimize the maintenance. We have a few of we have two of these, uh, let's say, kind of catering trucks. Uh, in this way, in this case, they cater uh, the the cryo cryogenic front ends. Uh, every year, a cryogenic front end has to be uh, replaced. Uh, the cold head, the, the 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 central cold unit, has to be reworked. And you don't want to bring the whole antenna down, of course, just for this front end. And the front end is not a small thing I showed you before. It's a, it's a real big thing. So what, the, uh, what we do now is, I still say we. It's, I only left one year ago. So um, what we do is uh, we, uh, we, uh, we mount a new front end, uh, cold front end, in the, in the truck. We drive it up. We exchange it here with the, with the other front end. And the antenna is uh, operational at the same, uh, at the same evening. Um, and then bring down the front end for refurbishment. One of the problems, and I, I, I mentioned the problems here, not because it was such a, uh, let's say, uh, well, it's everything that goes well is not news. So, so I, uh, I, I, I mentioned the problems because uh, it, it, it can teach us something. And um, in this case, what we found already uh, quite early, but not easy to change, was that um, uh, there was a, a certain lack of robustness of the system. These machines, as, uh, these very high-tech machines, they are, and the infrastructure is really well thought of, but um, it, it lacked, for example, remote monitoring and control. So although these uh, uh, receivers transmit, uh, f uh, measure photons from tens of light years away, a million light years away, um, it was not possible to read out the power status of the, of the antenna. So when we had a power glitch, uh, we, could not, we could not know which of the antennas was infected, aff affected. It was all solved, but it's, it's an, it's an uh, example of uh, where, uh, let's say, solid system engineering, having, looking at the whole system, a high-level requirement is availability of the array. And what was insufficiently realized is that availability of the array is, is, uh, uh, influences also some basic features, not only the size of the dish and the efficiency, but also the the, this, this, what I just mentioned, remote control. But it was all solved, but it cost some time. So, what has been achieved? For the first time, 
we had a, such a large worldwide collaboration in astronomy to have such distributed manufacturing. A large observatory to operate at 5,000 meters. Uh, a large interferometer at such high frequencies, all firsts. State-of-the-art technology in large quantities. 66 high-precision antennas complete with sensitive cryogenic receivers. And beyond state-of-the-art technology in detectors, astronomers were really st uh, stunned by the first images that they got. And this, what I show here, is one of the first images. And everyone, uh, everyone that sees it for the first time expects that this is an artist's impression. But it's not an artist's impression. It's a, it's a relatively nearby star. It's, I don't know exactly, 30, 40 light years. One million years old, very, very young star, relatively young. And this is a, actually a planet system, planetary system forming. So you can see the, the, a, di a disk of matter, gas and dust. Um, this is about the size of our solar system. So Pluto would be around here. Yeah, so this is a huge system. And where the dark areas are, the dark rings, are most likely areas where now new planets are forming. And this is an absolutely unique picture. It was never seen before. So what made ALMA a success? Um, a strong multinational, multicultural collegiality, a large dedication of staff, most, most staff, not everyone, uh, great science yield straight from the beginning. What I didn't mention is that even when we had six, only 16 antennas up, that was in, in 2011, September. Uh, we started with early science, with a limited um, uh, number of modes, observational modes, and with limited sensitivity, but already uh, the whole system worked, from antennas to correlator, uh, data analysis software, everything. So that was very stimulating uh, for everyone uh, to see that the system worked. And system engineering has been proven in many areas, as I showed, not all areas. What we see here, is also a very nice result, I think. This is an Einstein ring. That means that uh, it's a superposition of an ALMA image, that's the red, and a Hubble Space Telescope image, that's the blue. And the blue is a foreground uh, uh, galaxy at only four billion light years away. And it's exactly in line with the with another uh, galaxy, which is 12 billion light years away, so it's really at the edge of the, of the observable universe. And it's, they're exactly aligned. And what you get is then gravitational uh, 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 effects, whereby the light from the, from the faraway galaxy is amplified and distorted uh, by the foreground galaxy. But there are ways to model this, uh, the effects, and I don't have the results here now, but you can model this back. It is like a very bad lens, so it's very deformed. But you can model it back to the, to the, to the real uh, um, um, form of the shape of the, of the galaxy. So it's a very, very beautiful result. OK, personal remarks. Um, the problems that we saw were seldom really technically difficult. There were issues of will and politics and finances, etc. Um, and it also shows where I think uh, where, what we all know is that uh, you can have solid system engineering um, uh, uh, techniques, but you, it, it, it only works if you know if if your uh, uh, let's say if your uh, environment. Uh, allows it to work. Um, and the big challenge, and uh, connected to that is a, a very, the largest challenge is to keep the shared set of goals and values, to keep the shared set of goals and values, and to have open processes to resolve differences. When the going gets, gets tough, the tough get going. And um, uh, what, what we saw is at the end of the project, of the construction project, when the budget gets lower and tighter and more difficult, that it's more difficult to keep working as a, as a team. We did it. it was, we did it, but that was one of the big challenges. So for me, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That's for, that's for sure. 
and I'm very proud that I have been part of this. What you see on the background is, by the way, uh, it's a picture of uh, almost exactly a year ago of Pluto and Charon on two days, four days. So this is Pluto. Uh, it's not a planet anymore, as you know. It's a dwarf planet. <laughs> there are good reasons for that. Um, and Charon is uh, Charon is 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 like uh, like our moon um, around. Uh, how do you say that? Revolving. Revolving. Um, and this, I show this picture because this, was, this measurement was done by ALMA in, uh, in a wavelength range uh, that fits with the temperature of Pluto. The uh, temperature of Pluto is like 40 Kelvin, 230 degrees below zero centigrade. And this picture allowed New Horizons to pinpoint even more secure the location of, of Pluto. So that helped. Uh, uh, loca uh, 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 making the location of Pluto much more precise. And this has nothing to do with ALMA, but I mean, this is one year later, two days ago, these stunning false color pictures, but it's, the structure is as it is of Pluto and Charon. And uh, I thought that was a nice way to end this talk. Thank you. <laughs>